Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk a little bit about something that in this it has always been important but is um, increasing in importance for us all, all over the programs and, and departments in DFID very rapidly. And that is the need to build resilience in agriculture and rural development. Um, now, many people will ask, oh, what is resilience? Or is it what we can read into it? And to give you an example of an experience I had yesterday, I called an organization whose view I wanted. I'm not going to tell you the name, but I asked them so what their thinking is about resilience. And the first question was, what? How do you spell that? I mean, that was not very encouraging, but that doesn't make the agenda any less um, important. Now, let me tell you a little bit where DFID is coming from in its thinking and why we think it is so important. For those of you who are on the phone but might have the presentation in front of you, I'll give you the slide number. I'm now moving to slide number two. Um, so. Why do we think resilience is important? First of all, and I work in the food and nutrition security team for the Global Policy Division, we see that there is very little, if any, progress on MDG 1C, which is the one on hunger and undernutrition, and the recent reports we've seen have under confirmed that. The problem is very sticky, and it's not only important because it's our bailiwick and what we do every day, it also undermines progress in human and economic development in all other areas that we're working on. And um, that is, of course, a big problem. And it is an even greater problem because we have seen in the food crisis in 2008 and 2011, um, we had additional millions added to the people who fall into poverty and probably chronic food insecurity. And I'm not even mentioning the regular drought and other disaster onsets that we are facing and where we'll have probably a lot higher number with higher impacts in the future. Something that we are all aware of is population growth. In 2050, we have, what, 9.3 billion people, all of them want to eat, and with Western consumption habits, newly emerging middle classes want to eat different things. And our planet has to grow all of that and yield all of that with a very limited and rather reducing number of resources in, an, in a situation where climate change is becoming a daily reality for some, of us, for some of us and has been a daily reality for many people for a long time. I spent 10 years in Africa until a year ago and there climate change was a daily reality. And that was something that people in the Western world, where I live now, were not very aware of. So those are facts, and we cannot talk them away. Um, I already mentioned shocks and crises are increasing in number um, and impact. They might not really kill as many people as they used to, at least not directly, but they affect the poor more, and they affect them worse than in the past. All of that is a pretty deadly cocktail, and it's an even greater challenge in an era of economic volatility and scarce financial resources. Um, all of that also makes us think more strongly about resilience because we might have less or at least not more money, so we have to make sure that we maximize sustainable outcomes and increase value for money um, in everything that we do. And we do a few things differently. For example, how we relate between humanitarian and development programs. Now, let me move on to slide number three. Today's reality among poor people is very often this. You have, scare, you have very precarious livelihoods, and we're trying to uplift them in our programs. And then there is a, there is a crisis, there is a shock, there is a disaster, and the downward spiral starts. Now, the traditional assumption has been we do a bit of response, we do a bit of recovery work, people go back to where they started before the crisis, and we help them again to improve by way of development. This is not a fact. Every time a crisis or a shock has hit very vulnerable populations, many of them are worse off than before, recovery programming or not, and they will not have enough time to recover until the next crisis starts. And that makes for a rapid, rapidly accelerating downward spiral of livelihoods, which for more and more people very quickly hits the threshold of survival. So that can end in disaster. That's definitely what we don't want, but what we see very often. Now, what do we want? It's a little bit more like this. Let me explain what I mean. 
Um, humanitarian programs have the mandate and the mission to ensure survival, number one, but also to protect livelihoods. And we want to make sure that a crisis or a shock that hits, and that's the downward arrow, uh, arrow that we cannot avoid. Um, it hits, but it will not throw people back or get them on the downwards trajectory, but they will be in a position to survive, to maintain their level of food security and livelihoods, and or ideally strengthen it and continue the upward trajectory out of food insecurity and out of poverty. So um, while we are not um, naive as to believe that a shock or a crisis will not have any impact, it should be planned for, there should be time, it, it should be given, um, it should be a moment where where maybe development flatlines a little bit, but it should not be, throw people back. So they should continue on an upward trajectory. So how do we capture that? We have talked for about resilience now, but we haven't defined it. Um, we started out by discussing it from the humanitarian point of view, and we defined disaster resilience. For us, it's the, the ability of countries, communities, and households to manage change by maintaining or transforming living standards in the face of shocks or stresses, such as earthquakes, drought, or violent conflict, or maybe even high food prices or continued volatility at high levels, without them compromising their long-term prospects. And that is what I meant by the upward trajectory not being broken. So broadly, it means that people, households, communities, and countries can manage change by maintaining or ideally transforming their living standards in spite of shocks and stresses and continue to, de uh, to develop. I'm moving now to slide number six um, to explain a little bit our thinking in the past. In 2006 in DFID, we published our disaster risk reduction policy, which was the origin of our resilience thinking um, without calling it by this term. We committed ourselves then to mainstreaming DRR into all of our country strategies, and we also created the first links to climate change. What we want now is not to mainstream resilience, because we feel that is not enough, but I'll talk about that later. We also then committed us to allocating 10% of our humanitarian spend on post-disaster recovery and building back better in line with the Hyogo commitment and many other donors did likewise. But we felt that this is not enough. This is neither pulling together the relevant program well enough, nor is it yielding sufficient responses in the face of increasing crisis and shocks. In 2011, we published an independent review led by Lord Ashdown of all our humanitarian emergency response funding, which came up with the recommendation that resilience should be the greater ambition, and we fully accepted this recommendation in our response. Um, we are learning while we are debating it internally from the debates in other donor circles, for example, ECHO's preparedness discussion, the EC's LRD, linking relief, rehabilitation, and development debate, the thinking around sustainability and other relevant agendas. Resilience builds on all of these, but it goes and it should go beyond that. Now, what are we doing? Um, our commitments are as follows. We want to res address resilience in all country programs by 2015, and discussions are underway. What I'm telling you now is our thinking to date, and it doesn't mean that we have all the answers, but we are actively debating these priority countries where we will have inbuilt resilience plans that are focusing on resilience as some kind of objective for everything we do are Ethiopia, Kenya, Malawi, Mozambique, Nepal, and Bangladesh. As you can easily see, they're very vulnerable. They have high poverty rates, and they have high hunger and malnutrition rates. So that's quite a tall order. But we felt those are countries where we have a program that where resilience, a resilience lens can lead us to a new level and ideally to a quantum leap. 
At a second tier, we will be considering Pakistan, Niger, Chad, South Sudan, Zimbabwe, and Burma. And of course, as its, as its country programs, it has to be a choice, a selection of countries where we are actively engaged. We are also looking at two regions where we don't have country-level representations, and that's the Sahel and Caribbean. Again, they're obvious for their vulnerability, and unfortunately, the Sahel is also in the headlines again these days. We have committed ourselves to leading internationally to embed disaster resilience in key institutions, governments, and processes. And we have committed ourselves to, to forging or strengthening coherent links between humanitarian and development work, and particularly, in particular in fragile and conflict situations. This is a tall order, and this is something that others have tried before um, and managed more or less well. But we think resilience is the overarching interest that will, will have to unite us if we want to be successful. As I said before, we have intermediate results, but we have many discussions underway at the moment, and I'll tell you about a few examples. We also don't want resilience to be an all-encompassing theme, because then we talk about it and we will end up achieving nothing. So we said for the countries that we are looking at and for, for um, our needs assessments, food and nutrition security will be at the center of our priority efforts on resilience, social protection, and of course, climate change, because it is something that affects us, that affects us more every day, and we need to find our way forward. Um, what does it look like in real life? This is slide number eight now. Um, this is an example I like a lot. Um, it's from the micro level. Resilience goes much further, but I think it exemplifies in a small way what um, we mean and what also makes all the difference for poor people. These Bangladeshi women used to get a large share of their income from farming chicken. Now they have floods all the time. Chicken don't survive very well. So their livelihood was built and destroyed sometimes within the period of just a couple months. Um, what we discussed then was to think about change being inevitable, to nobody being in a position to avoid the next flood, so maybe to manage for it and to plan for it. Now what these people, what these women are now doing, they have shifted from chicken to ducks. Ducks can swim survive the next flood so their livelihood is preserved that is in a small way what resilience should be in a large way briefly this is what our framework looks like um, just very quickly if you look at it from left to right it's still a little bit linear but it captures the essence of what we mean we have always the question first what context are we in resilience is not a one-size-fits-all fit all. What, what kind of resilience do we want? For who, of, of resilience of what? A resilience of who? That depends on the context. Then we have disturbance, shocks or stresses. What resilience do we want to build? Resilience of who to what? Now you see the blue bubbles, which represent the adaptive capacity. Assets, structures, processes, livelihood strategies. This is a model that puts human capacities, adaptive capacities, at the center. If these are good, the sensitivity, that's the green bar, will be low, and coping capacities and resilience will be high. So the errors on the right-hand side will be in the upper corner. So people will become more food secure or maintain their food security, and will not, they will either bounce back or bounce back better, but they will not go on the vulnerability pathway and have their livelihood either deteriorate or collapse. Um, the next slide, number 10, whose resilience are we talking about? Um, resilience should in the long term exist at, at, at many levels. We're starting at the individual and the household level, um, but we should have resilience at the local, national, international level, in institutions, in communities, governments, and in families, across the various livelihood dimensions. So, summing this up, what's new? You might want to, want to ask, how is this different from the good old 
sustainable development programming. The major feature that differentiates this is that the resilience approach acknowledges the fact of continuous change, sometimes in the form of stresses, sometimes in the form of shocks. But it's, it can be planned for, it cannot be avoided. So capacities are inbuilt to manage this change, not just to cope with it and survive, but to manage it. It cuts across all sector programs. It links, it has to link humanitarian development programming and not as a cross-cutting issue, which often ends up being swept under the carpet, but as a lens through which we look at everything we do. And the beauty of it is it will help to clarify priorities and it will also define trade-offs. For example, if we look at agriculture, we want to increase productivity to feed the world, but we also want food and nutrition security. Some programs may have a trade-off, but they don't have to have a trade-off. So how do we have to design an agricultural program so that it, mean, um, it, it yields maximum outcomes for nutrition as well? And based on these types of clear, clarified priorities and clearly defined trade-offs, stakeholders will be able to take informed decisions. Um, and it is a decision to define what kind of resilience a government wants, for whom, and against what. This is not a given. And what, for example, is an acceptable minimum of resilience? If we can manage to achieve this, then, and this is slide number 12, we will achieve a true paradigm shift in everything we do in humanitarian assistance and development. We will achieve increased impact at better value for money with more sustainability or rather resilience because change is inbuilt and change can be managed and be managed well. If this paradigm shift happens, then that has meant we have managed to overcome silos. We work across sectors. We work together for this overarching objective of resilient people, resilient communities. And it requires us to look at our successes and failures. It requires us to measure what we do and also to admit if, for example, an agricultural program does maybe not yield the nutrition benefit that we expected it to yield. And then we have to do it differently. Um, what is the way forward for DFID? Slide number 13. In international circles, we have committed ourselves to leading the debate without claiming to know all the answers. But we would like to make a vital contribution because we've seen this as a major leap forward. Our Secretary of State for Development, Andrew Mitchell, has committed himself to act as a political champion for resilience. Others have joined him. We would consider traditional and non-traditional donors, recipient countries, key multilaterals, and to the extent that civil society representatives are keen to lead with us to be absolutely vital to join this debate. We don't want to have this resilience debate everywhere, but we would like to start with hotspot countries. And you've seen from our shortlist that that is um, what we're doing. And we also don't want it in the head offices of donors countries. We want the debate to take place ideally where affected people live and where the benefits can be gained. We want to build on existing work and processes, even if they don't talk about resilience but go in the right direction. We want to add value and we want to push for reform where it is needed. Now, slide number 14. What does it mean for us in DFID as a donor organization? What does it mean at the center and what does it mean when we work with um, country offices? We are currently debating with many country offices what it means. What do, how do we have to change structures and processes to move the agenda forward as DFID for the funding that we are responsible for? What does it mean for a country program to embed disaster resilience? What does it mean for an emerging post-MDG agenda? What would we define as a minimum level of resilience that we want to stand up for? Do we want to mainstream it across a country office? Or do we have a vertical program? Or in some countries, should we have both? What are our tools? What partners should we be working with? How do we go to scale? 
all this is very important and we're not claiming we have all the answers but we know it is important to move forward on the agenda and to use it to give you an example of debates we're having in countries at the moment in in DRC you will know that there are incredibly high chronic malnutrition figures it's a conflict country so it has a lot of humanitarian assistance but no resilience on food and nutrition security that starts with coordination if it is keen to help to facilitate humanitarian and development agents in the country this is one facet how we can contribute to strengthening um, to strengthening resilience in this country in another country it may look totally different but we have to move on it, we have to discuss it, and countries have to own it. So these are the remarks I have, and I'm keen to hear the experience that you have in your organizations and to see what kind of examples you would like to share and the questions you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Iris, for that presentation. Um, again, as always, you managed to get it all into a brief 15 to 20 minutes and and I'm sure especially following the AGA and everyone's participation there and the key topic of resilience um, that this is definitely a starting point for discussion and I would therefore like to open the discussion round now. Iris, do you have any um, sort of engaging points, you, any questions you'd like to ask? Well, I'd be very interested. There are a number of, of, of donor representatives here of whom I know you are having a similar debate, a very active debate in your own organization now. So um, I'd be very interested in hearing what your insights are, what the level of discussion is, and how you see this. I mean, we, we've seen it. It's not a one-size-fits-all. It's absolutely crucial for most of our programs. And we have to have separate discussions on all of them. There are common trends, but there is no one-size-fits-all. So how do you handle those debates? Thank you very much for a, an interesting presentation um, um, and, and a very graphic one as well. I, I just wanted to ask something. Um, we're here discussing payment. I'm sure most of the participants are uh, discussing quite a lot about uh, what, what kind of um, work we might do on resilience um, and, and on the concept of it. As you say, this is an emerging concept. And one thing that we, we discuss a bit is, the, is whether actually we're talking about uh, resilience as a response to um, periodic shock um, uh, rather than ongoing systemic conditions. And I got from your presentation the, the impression that the different approach to it is very much thinking about it uh, as a response to periodic shock. Whereas um, there are other points of view which would say that you need to actually build resilience to uh, some of the more chronic and ongoing situations which um, households trying to uh, trying to make their lives more productive space like um, uh, chronic bad uh, chronic market failures or political exclusion um, or, or disempowerment of, of, of one sort or another uh, I'm wondering is that a debate that you're having in this and have you actually fallen down or it lent more to the size of uh, dealing with uh, shock and um, rather than more, more ongoing situations. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Um, as I said earlier, we started from the humanitarian angle, and of course, then you start discussing shocks. From there, we said we want people to be resilient to disasters if they live in vulnerable areas. But that is not enough. We want resilient people. And for example, food, well, depends on the terminology. Food price shocks happened in 2008 and 2011. Is continued volatility a uh, shock? No, it isn't. It is change. And it is, uh, in some cases, a crisis. But it is also something that, that affects many more people than would be captured by, or different people than would be captured by humanitarian response. And we don't want these people to be resilient. Um, so how do we manage that? And we have programs where, at the end of the day, we want um, we have an overarching goal. I gave you this example of agriculture, where we want economic growth to be strengthened for good reasons through agricultural growth. But we are also having an interest in food and nutrition security. Now, we, if we want resilient people, we have to make sure that this agricultural um, 
program supports this resilience objective uh -huh. so that it supports food and nutrition security and yeah. doesn't maybe do damage or maybe we have the aspiration of improved nutrition security but we're not getting it then we have to rethink this and we cannot have programs that or social protection programs you know that if it is investing heavily in social protection programs if people are not resilient in spite of them then there is something wrong then we have to look into that and I gave you food prices as an example where we have cash transfer programs. How can we make them better? How can these ones cope with high, with high inflation? How can they cope with volatility? And how can, what can we do to design social protection programs that capture that better? You may have seen in the recent World Bank and IDS report that social protection programs are not just patchy, but they also we're not able to capture a lot of the shocks and crises of recent years. One reason is coverage, another one is inflexible design. So we're discussing that. That goes wa vastly beyond shocks. That is the, our intention to have people m become more resilient to manage the change that is inevitable, that they cannot avoid, that nobody else can avert. I have a raised hand from Adam Muller. You have the floor. Um, I want to ask Iris whether the DFID has specific examples of um, scaling up adoption of sustainable land management practices so as to increase um, ecosystems and human resilience. Does DFID have any examples of this kind of um, practice or using this framework? Thank you. Um, did I understand your question right um, as to examples of scaling up the adoption of good land management practices? What that was that what you wanted to know, Ademula? Exactly, that's it. Um, of course, what good land management practices are is a bit location specific. In, um, I was think, just thinking of a number of examples where we are investing in in. Uh, upscaling conservation agriculture as in some parts of Zimbabwe. Oh, I can see you now. That's, that's wonderful. And uh, in other areas, like in Rwanda, good management practices start with secure ownership and use of the land that farmers are on. So we are supporting a transparent and equitable land regularization process. So we have some of those examples at scale. But um, these are examples where we are fortunate enough to think we can do it. We have, um, we have the skills and capacities to support the government in doing this. And um, it is also possible to do it at scale. Other area, in other areas, it's a little bit more difficult. And give, remaining with the um, example of conservation agriculture, we're also working in some countries where we, we are testing in how far this is, an, it is a solution for, lo for rural agriculture that might be locally owned. locally owned. And we are not successful yet at scale. So um, it depends a bit on the country and the specific situations you're looking at. But yes, it can be done. But we also have to be realistic about the time and the investment and the follow-up it needs. And I, that's what I also said. Um, when I said we need to clarify priorities of what we want to support as donors, and then we need to bring out the trade-offs and find solutions. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Uh, thanks, Iris. Uh, great presentation. Just a quick question on um, metrics and whether DFID has ever or is starting to look at how do you measure the the resilience, right? How do you how can you report back on it? Uh, any thoughts? <laughs> you just won the cake. <laughs> that, is the, that is the question. And I can assure you, we have had a zillion discussions about this question already across DFID, and we have not come up with a clear answer other than um, tending towards defining resilience for specific situations and in humanitarian defining resilience in a sector-specific way. L let me stick with food security because um, that's what I know best. What is resilient food security? Um, it is something that we have 
and, and we're still finalizing the wording. You'll see that at some point. We'll definitely share this. Um, it's about having a, a not just the preserved level of food security, which, by the way, we measure by the whole methodology indicator set of the IPC, the Integrated Food Security Classification, but also to, um, to improve it step by step further, in spite of shocks, in spite of crisis. And in order to do that, we are currently finalizing our linking our development food security programming directly to our humanitarian food security program, programming, including the indicator set. We have now started funding the IPC to roll out their improved um, methodology, version 2.0, but also to road test their new chronic food insecurity scale. And by measuring both, and defining different thresholds for what we would consider, what we would count as resilient food security, we will also be able to bridge this gap between humanitarian and development programming better, where we had, like many donors, had totally different indicators in the past, but talked about the same thing and very often about the same geographic areas and same same um, people, same communities. So by pulling that together across the sectors, for example, you know that the IPC has water sanitation indicators, it has livelihoods indicators, and that all feeds into food security, and we're pulling in the humanitarian all the way to the long-term development programming and, and define our thresholds for resilient food security there based on comparable and linked up methodologies. We hope that that will be better for us not just better to measure what we accomplish, but also to pull out synergies and, and make sure that pro programs support one another and, and reinforce impact as opposed to undermining them, which unfortunately, especially between humanitarian development, happens very often in many parts of the world. Um, one facet is also coordination, and I mentioned the example of DRC earlier, where humanitarians and development practitioners need to talk more in order to tease out where they need to link up and where they might also undermine each other's agendas. And I'm not just talking about DFID and I'm not talking only about food security, I'm talking about the, the donor community in general and also in, and in particular national governments where often humanitarian is the mandate of you know, disaster management authority and then you have the sector ministries, the line ministries, and never the twain shall meet. And that is also something that needs to change. David, is there anything you'd like to contribute yeah. here? Uh, first, thanks for a great presentation. Um, really appreciated that. Uh, just to, maybe to add that um, EGAD you know, held a high-level conference on resilience in Nairobi in early April, and um, and now there's an effort underway by donors coming out of that meeting to build a strong alliance to build a global alliance for resilience and growth and so uh if if anybody would like further information about that um we can certainly distribute it through the uh platform but um you know I think the next step in that is now to organize uh, a meeting a donor meeting to uh, discuss the way forward, and my understanding is that we're looking to organize that meeting within the, the next month or so. Uh, so just to flag that for everybody's attention. Um, no, I think that was great news. I didn't I did mention that because I also felt um, that maybe my professional deformation, it has gone um, through the news quite a lot, and um, I'm very happy that it brought out the challenges for our one of our main areas of interest for resilience and that's food and nutrition security um, where the humanitarian shouldn't always pick up where development has maybe not done the map the most or as much as it was able to and where the gum and some rates skyrocket but where this is minimized and um, where humanitarians have to do less because it has been better linked and we don't have so many people fall into food, acute food insecurity in the future. So resilience in the Horn of Africa, in the Sahel and all those other regions, uh, regions is not, not just something that we should be doing but we also need to do because 
we are realistically facing more shocks, but we're not realistically facing more available money or faster responsiveness. For me, I think that the fascinating part of this is we're talking about resilience in a much bigger context because for me, over the last few years, resilience seems to have been captured, if you like, in a more ecosystems, environmental, climate change type mode and not in the bigger picture. And so particularly, I think, at WFP, why this is exciting is because, you know, we always have this tension um, here about, you know, we do largely emergency work, but we do some development work, and then we're criticized. But in a level, you know, the development work that we do is about resilience. You know, when I was working in Bangladesh, the GAM rate there sort of went from 10 to 15% over seven years without any disasters and with a 9 percentage point fall in um, poverty. So, you know, somewhere along the line, you know, some things were appearing at least from an income perspective to be more resilient, but from a nutritional perspective, we're certainly going downhill. So I think, you know, for me, the real achievement of this is to move talking about resilience and being resilient in many dimensions and not just that, the, the sort of the environmental side of it. Thanks, Lynn. Iris, would you like to say um, something in reply? Well, I couldn't agree more. And that's why it's on uh, such an exciting agenda. And it is, it is also, of course, a sensitive agenda because, as I said many times before, it will clarify priorities that may not always have been so clear. And it will bring out trade-offs. And it will force us to face the fact if we have priorities one, two, three, and we see that some of our programs may undermine the resilience of people for those priorities, then we do have to change them or we do have to link up with others that we may not have linked up. And then I'm getting back to, to the need to much, much more strongly link humanitarian and development workers and, and, and stakeholders. And I know WFP will, will agree with me on that, but that is something that um, I think the time is right for that. Thanks, Iris. I think that's actually a really good note to end on. Um, I do hope that all these discussions will sort of carry on, and I will give you Iris's email address for that. Um, I think we've had, I mean, we've had a great contribution, OECD, World Bank, Canadian CEDA, USAID, and World Food Program, all in the space of those 40 minutes. So I'm glad um, you all participated today, and thanks for your comments and contributions to the discussion. This, um, Virtual Briefing will be up as a webcast on donorplatform.org. So if you have any colleagues who'd like to see it or if you missed the beginning, please just don't hesitate, go up there onto the Virtual Briefing site and have a look. Um, and any other questions, please do let me know. Um, and on that note, I would like to say goodbye and say thanks to you all. And hopefully see you again soon. <laughs>